Good morning. I had envisioned something a little less formal, so <laughs> I hope my remarks will, will be what LCI wanted. I would like to start with a reading from the Gospel of St. Matthew. Jesus, when he saw how great was their number, went up to the mountainside. There he sat down and his disciples came about him. And he began speaking to them. This was the teaching he gave. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are the patient, they shall inherit the land. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for holiness, they shall have their fill. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be counted the children of God. Blessed are those who suffer persecution in the cause of right. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and speak all matter of evil against you falsely because of me. Be glad and lighthearted, for a rich reward awaits you in heaven. So it was they persecuted the prophets who went before you. You are the salt of the earth. If salt loses its taste, what is there left to give taste to it? There is no more to be done with it, but to throw it out of doors for men to tread underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city cannot be hidden if it is built on a mountaintop. A lamp is not lighted to be put under a bushel measure. It is put on a lampstand to give light to all the people of the house. And your light must shine so brightly before men that they can see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I was asked to speak about Christian hospitality. I think we can see the roots of Christian hospitality all through the Old and New Testaments. The story of Abraham and Lot is one example. Martha and Mary waiting upon our Lord is another. Our Lady is perhaps the supreme example. What Christian has not envisioned her patiently and lovingly serving Christ and Saint Joseph? And then there is Jesus himself. He ate with his disciples. He fed the thousands who were hungry. There are countless account examples in the Gospels where he is accepting someone's hospitality. When asked by his disciples where he was staying, he answered simply, come and see. His last supper on earth was just that, a meal given to feed us with his own body and blood. After his resurrection, his disciples knew him in the breaking of the bread. But as I began to reflect about Christian hospitality, I realized that though I, I try to do it and have many opportunities to practice it in daily life, and though I have thought quite a lot about it, my thinking and reflection about it over the past few years has changed. I am a Catholic. I am a wife and I am a mother. I'm a Catholic thanks to the grace of God and to the devout Catholic upbringing of my parents and thanks to Pope St. John Paul II. I'm originally from Denver, Colorado, near the Rocky Mountains in the United States. I am one of eight children, most of whom are happily married now. We are spread all over the United States and Europe, and the 40th grandchild was born in late December to my parents. <coughs> Growing up, we always had someone visiting us. Our house was constantly full. Christmas, St. Patrick's Day, Easter, birthdays, Thanksgiving, there was always a celebration. We would have Archbishop Stafford in one corner with my grandmother, and in the other corner, Bernadette, Bernadine Regal, a 94-year-old woman alone in the world, whom my mother had met at a coffee and do donut social at the cathedral in Denver. She'd be visiting with one of my brothers. The Vietnamese family my parents had sponsored in the 1970s would come, bearing many gifts. Only their children spoke English. My uncle, who has his PhD in humanities and describes himself as an atheist humanist, whatever that is, <laughs> would be debating with Father Donald Keith, the Archbishop of Denver's resident theologian 
and Scott Hahn's thesis advisor. Finally, there were my 50 plus cousins, aunts and uncles and vi various friends who had no other place to go. Monsignor Heaster would be playing on the piano and all would join in the singing. Irish coffees and desserts, good food and wine were always flowing. Everyone felt welcome and everyone felt at home. This was my school of hospitality. All of our guests had something in common. All were welcomed in the name of Christ by my parents. All were served with love. Most had no other place to go. And that included the Archbishop. My mother introduced herself at his installation mass and invited him to Thanksgiving dinner. He politely refused three or four times. Perhaps he was Slovak. <laughs> my mother asked, well, do you have other plans? Honestly, he said, no, I don't. Then you are coming to us, she said. So began a 30-year friendship between us and Cardinal Stafford. It was in our home he relaxed and laughed, spoke to faithful Catholics and to atheists, and asked us, the teenagers, what we thought of having a World Youth Day in Denver. It was to us he told his joy after that World Youth Day and of Pope St. John Paul II's joy at seeing all the youth and their love for Christ. He needed our hospitality as much as the lonely old woman Bernadine did and was just as grateful to receive it. I think we received more from them than they received from us. I am deeply grateful to my parents for their example of generous Christian hospitality. I remember some of the work. It was with sighs and grumbling that we would vacuum and set the table, pick up our toys, do the dishes, or collect all the trash left by a great evening. But more than the work, I remember the wonder, joy, and awe I felt to feel part of something so magical. I know that's sort of a taboo term, but that captures it. I remember when the Fellowship of Catholic Scholars came to Denver, and on a whim, all were invited to dinner at our house. Witnessing theologians like Peter Kreeft and Helen Hulk Hitchcock debate a topic at our dinner table was formative in my life, to say the least. My parents were generous, perhaps even reckless with their generosity, but I am grateful for it. Now I am a wife. I am a wife of a Byzantine Catholic priest. Yes, you heard correctly, my husband is a Catholic priest. His Bishop of Košice, Slovakia, is able to ordain married men to the priesthood. But that is a whole other talk, or even a whole other conference. And I'm a mother to eight, of course I must say, wonderful children. <laughs> we live in Trumau, Austria, a small town outside of Vienna. My husband and I met here in Gaming 21 years ago. We were married here in the Kartauza 16 years ago yesterday. We spent the first eight years of our married life here in Gaming. We welcomed our first five children home here in Gaming to our 15th century monk's house. Life was simple and somewhat perfect. A beautiful country, a pristine town, the fairy tale Kartauza, and being surrounded by wonderful Catholic people who all happened to be my friends. It was very easy to host. Of course, there were the usual difficulties, how to cook a meal, set the table nicely, and tidy up the house with four small children under the age of five was a challenge. Our house was small. How could we fit 10 people around a small table and still have enough room to eat together? How could I make a cheesecake and fit it into a European-sized refrigerator? These were big challenges indeed. <laughs> but then we were hosting wonderful people, bishops and priests from all over the world, visiting and in local intellectuals, and friends who had come to visit or revisit the Kartauza. It was a lot of work but it was very happy work. At the same time, something else was happening. I and we were being hosted all over Europe, from Slovakia to Romania, from Ukraine and Hungary to Croatia and Slovenia, Austria to Germany to France and England, even to Scotland. We were hosted as a family. 
we were welcomed in Switzerland, Liechtenstein, all over the United States. Beds were made for us, meals cooked, truly Christian hospitality given. Once again, I was in a school of hospitality, a school of love. There are many faces I see here today who were my professors in that school. To all of you, I say thank you. I have learned from your great example of love. My main reflections about hospitality at this point were about beauty. In a world that can be and often is shockingly ugly, I felt beauty was my mission. To claim beauty in my heart, beauty in my life, beauty in my home, in my family. This was my apostolate, I felt. Then a series of events happened which would change everything. Two families who were instrumental in my intellectual and spiritual formation moved away from Gaming. A year later, we were moved out of Gaming to Trumau. Less than two hours away from beautiful, idyllic, perfect Gaming, and yet light years away. We moved from our small 15th century monk's house in the middle of the mountains to low income, subsidized housing in the middle of a hostile town. Suddenly I had no urge to host. It was not coming naturally as it had in Gaming. We had no space to host. Everything around us was ugly. I was expecting a baby again and was very tired. I was mourning the loss of Gaming and all of my dear friends. I was surrounded by people I did not want to be with and had no desire to host. It was Lent of that year that my husband and I came to a decision. We had overheard one of our daughters, at that time age seven, speaking to a friend. She was complaining about how our new apartment, our new town, everything about our new life there was awful. And I heard myself echoed in her words. I had taught her well. I had taught her to complain. So my husband and I decided we had to love Trumau. We had to love the people who were given us there, and furthermore, we had to serve them. It had all come too easily, too comfortably in Gaming. Now we were going to have to work for it. So we did work for it. In our tiny, ugly second floor apartment, we created a home. We welcomed those around us and those that visited us. One of my sons looks back to that place and sighs. Oh, Mama, do you remember that apartment? But it had been a home for him. He loved it. I didn't. I loved it. <laughs> then we were moved again, this time onto the ITI campus in Trumau amidst the students. No longer in the middle of unbelievers, but still with very little privacy. Our challenges were growing children and shrinking space, increasing responsibilities and decreasing time and the general fatigue which accompanies all of this. But we kept to our decision. We decided if we can't have the people we love in the place we love, we'll love the place we're in and we'll love the people we welcome into it. And that's what we've tried to do for the last seven years. My reflections now about Christian hospitality include three main things. Of course, the first would be beauty. It is even more important now than it was 16 years ago. But it is also important for me to say that this is not a, an aestheticism or materialistic beauty. There are books and magazines full of glossy pictures of perfectly set tables, incredible menus, wonderfully paired wines. This is not the Christian hospitality I am seeking now. Indeed, some of those books or pictures or Facebook postings might make us want to throw up our hands and forget hosting when looking how imperfectly we may do it. When faced with perfection, it is tempting to give up, but we must remember G.K. Chesterton's words, a thing worth doing is worth doing badly. While good food and good wine, beautiful plates, flowers, cloth napkins, wonderful conversation, can all add to the wonder of the moment. They are not the essential element. The second element I find is the element of love. 
To host one's neighbor out of love for him and for God is a holy work. It is not always easy, tidy, and perfect, but if it is truly done with love, the grace to do it is always given, and it is an action that is never wasted. The Slavic peoples have a beautiful saying, guest in the home, God in the home, and they act accordingly. Would that we could all welcome our guests with such love. The third element I see that is fundamental in Christian hospitality is one of joy, another element missing in our modern world. This to me is the true hallmark of Christian hospitality and indeed of our Christian faith. It flows directly from the love one has for God and one's neighbor. It is what we have experienced in a deep way in our lives. So while there are countless magazines and books that will show you how to lay that perfect table and websites that will coach you through how to make the ultimate chocolate cake, I think Christian hospitality is more basic than that. I think it is actually quite simple. It is the opening of one's heart and home to a friend or to a stranger. It was what was witnessed to me by my parents and by many of you. This hospitality can take very different forms in each of us. For some of us, it may be to invite that family that is new to town or the one that has way too many children. For some of us, it may be visiting or inviting the lonely person over who has no place to go for Christmas, or perhaps the difficult person who is hard to be around. Who we host and how we host will vary due to personal strength, our family situation, and the people we encounter. The essential element is our openness, not our success. St. Mother Teresa said, if you can't feed 100 hungry people, Feed one. I would add, if you can't feed them Chateaubriand with cream brulee, then feed them tea and scones, or even just coffee. At the beginning of this talk, I read from the Beatitudes. What is their connection to Christian hospitality? I think if we are poor in spirit, patient, mourning, hungering, and thirsting for justice, merciful, clean of heart, peacemakers, and suffering persecution for the sake of righteousness in our homes, and we welcome others into it, we are fulfilling our Lord's wish. And likewise, if we welcome the poor in spirit, the patient, the mourning, those hungering and thirsting for justice and holiness, the merciful, the clean of heart, the peacemakers, and no suffering persecution for the sake of righteousness into our homes, we will be fulfilling the Lord's command. It is giving them an experience of the beauty of your life that has been touched by Christ. It is in loving them because God has first loved us. And it is in doing all of this with a grateful, joyful spirit. If we do this, we will be the salt of the earth. And if we do this, we will be the light of the world. If we do this, we will be the city set upon the hill. If we do this, we will meet Christ himself and we will have beatitude. Thank you very much. No. Oh.